Hello, and I'm John Rowland and uh, welcome you back to the stratosphere chamber where we've seen the big door before. But today, as it says on here, the Barnes-Wallace stratosphere chamber, we are going to have a look at some of the parts underneath the chamber. So this is a picture here, which kind of shows a cross section of the uh, chamber itself. And so we have the chamber here, and then it shows underneath a section which is above a insulated floor, uh, which is no longer there. However, the section in here is of quite interest in terms of all the items it shows us about the chamber, the way it was constructed, and some of the problems that they had when they were kind of operating it. So we're going to now go and have a look underneath the chamber. So having looked at a number of items around the door area and there's the electrical areas as well, um, we thought we might go quickly underneath the chamber here uh, because it uh, has the other end, as it were, of certain parts of what we've been talking about. But, uh, and if we come through the uh, very thick door, given that's a, had a foot of honours out there as part of the insulation, and uh, make sure we don't fall over down the ramps, but, uh, we uh, come into the underside of the chamber given that originally the underside was all heavily insulated and the only reason we have a ramp here that we came in on is because in the honours oak got removed after flooding in, I think it was 2000 was when the last floods, so they had to take it all away because it was all very saturated. Uh, there are small amounts of uh, the honours oak still left in some of the uh, workshop areas on the other far side, but otherwise we're, sitting, we're about uh, maybe 18 inches lower here than we would otherwise have normally been. But, uh, and as you can see in here, uh, being careful to avoid a lot of the junk which is around, although uh, I, this uh, particular model car was, uh, took, uh, took the fancy of a, somebody I showed in a, a few months ago who was fascinated to see it. He said it was, it, it was unique and he hadn't seen one quite like it before. Now, how much he really knew about these things, I don't know, but he did take half a dozen pictures of it. So there's an amazing amount of stuff you have around here. But as we go through, then we have things such as this, which uh, is a Concorde uh, compressor blade cover, uh, comes off an a Olympus engine, like the ones we have underneath the Concorde, or there's one up in the factory as well. Uh, and there's a, a very large amount of bits and pieces, which uh, many of which we don't really know what they are. Uh, unfortunately, the person who uh, introduced the material, he died around 2010, and uh, some of that knowledge has never been passed on. But uh, here we're passing one of the, uh, the trolleys, the trailers that got used in the factory area originally with BAE, uh, and there are a couple of examples of these which is in, in our factory area. But as we come across through here, there is an item which, uh, whether my light's going to cause a problem with uh, the filming, I'm not sure. But what we have here is uh, the uh, end of the heater system. So as has been stated in the past, the chamber could be heated up to around 40 odd degrees Celsius. Uh, and I suspect the actual, the, uh, actual temperature probably varied depending whether it was winter or in summer, given that uh, the uh, in, in summer, you've probably got an ambient of around 20 degrees, but in winter, we could be down to minus some, a number of degrees. So I suspect that heat trials would do be much better in the, during the summer period. But what we have here uh, is a, there's a 65 horsepower, I believe, uh, a blower here, which blows air drawn from under the chamber here uh, through what's behind this is uh, basically what we have is some heater blocks. Now, these are the heater blocks which are driven by the control panel which was on the other side uh, of the door. And as we walk through here, being a little bit careful of what we uh, might trip over, we believe these are parts of a Concorde, as are many bits around here. But uh, we have here the outlets from the heat block, heating blocks. So I believe the one here right next to us was used to heat this area underneath if they wanted to do a hot trial on something or other. And there's the other pipe that uh, takes off and would have been connected up, I suspect, into one of the ducts, and that would actually allow the hot air then to start circulating around the chamber. Although with uh, uh, 270 or maybe even up to 340 tonnes of steel up there, it must have taken a long time to warm up, even though they were basically nearly 200 kilowatts of power being used in here to actually heat up the air. Now, uh, the other things that we have around here uh, is a, a whole load of junk in many respects, 
but this area would have been clear in the days of when the chamber was being used, apart from experiments that may well take, have taken place. So we know that uh, they used it as a, a way of being able to provide an airspace which was very cold or warmed up. And uh, I, I know that at one point they did do some testing of uh, rail tracks under here to look at the expansion and contraction of the rails uh, over a, a, a extended sort of temperature ranges. So it was quite a useful space to be used for just the cold, I suspect mainly, or for hot trials. And uh, without all this material in here, we've, we have actually got a very large space to actually be working in. And uh, as I say, as you look around, you, you see lots of odd little features. Uh, for example, uh, at the top there, I think you've got ladders that were in place to uh, allow you to get up to the top of the chamber. Indeed, there's a drawing that shows ladders going all the way across the top, uh, but the space at the top must be of all of a, about a metre. And uh, so I'm not sure I'd really want to be crawling around up there during an experiment. Uh, and at the very top of the chamber, which you can see from inside, there are th uh, three portals or four portals which were there to allow you to look inside the chamber while it was actually operating. Now, to get to those, you would have to climb all the way up to the roof. And as I say, you've probably got all of about a metre space to crawl through up there. Uh, and uh, in some ways, I, I was relieved to hear from the history from Joe Hancock that those spaces were never used. So no one ever actually had to get up there during experimentation. Uh, and partly, I imagine, because uh, it wasn't too long before CCTV type cameras could be used as a way of actually monitoring what was going on inside the chamber if, if you couldn't really go in, which uh, at low pressures you, uh, you would have had, well, nobody would have been allowed in because it, uh, it would have been far too, uh, well, far too little air, shall we say, to breathe. So, okay, so that shows uh, the areas underneath the chamber here. And uh, we can see the uh, various points and mounts where the uh, chamber is actually supported. And uh, in fact, uh, if you look between the main part of the chamber here, and uh, these are effectively the foundations or the supports, you can see uh, some, an, a number of shims again, which were put in to get the chamber level, and some black, apparently, boxes underneath. Now, under, in there, in practice, there are rollers. So when the chamber expanded and contracted, the theory was that it would, uh, it would roll over the rollers to actually re relieve the pressure or the stress that's put into the foundations. I'm told that uh, by the end of the 50s that those didn't actually work at all. So I, I imagine the uh, foundations were sufficiently flexible to uh, allow the whole chamber to expand and contract appropriately. And as much as this end here basically was, uh, was allowed, in theory, to move, the other end, by where the great door is, was fixed permanently, so that wouldn't move. And that would, of course, allow you to make the seal on the door much more uh, effectively, shall we say, without the chamber trying to move under, under its, uh, the expansion and contraction that would took place. And uh, as we also had mentioned earlier, there's even, you can see more of these electrical bonds up here that we had talked about earlier when to underneath the door. So uh, we, in the, when we were underneath the door, we had made some reference to having uh, explosive proof uh, lightings. And there's another example of these here. So that one's actually still got a, a large, probably 150 watt bulb in it. Uh, with the sealed air and around it to prevent it coming into contact with any methanol fumes that could have caused an explosion. And uh, I say there's, there were a number of them around. There's, in fact, I can see one over there. But, uh, but the place must have been pretty dark, I suspect, when they were generally working in here. So I'm sure they must have brought lights in to do any work underneath here because it's uh, extremely dark, particularly when the door would have been closed. The whole thing would be very much sealed. Uh, because of the, uh, having the honours out and the uh, uh, insulation all around the whole place. Uh, the items that uh, we see here are some of the last remaining parts uh, that we know of for a Vickers Warwick aircraft, which was built in the latter part of World War II, uh, originally designed as a bigger or heavier bomber than the Wellington. However, uh, despite the fact they actually built around 800 of them, 
uh, they were never used as bombers, rather as heavy transport. Uh, and uh, also uh, the Coastal Command made use of quite a lot of them. And this, these parts basically came from somewhere uh, in the sea above uh, North Cornwall. I can't remember the exact place. Uh, and these parts were presumably trawled out of the sea, I suspect, mm. by a boat. Uh, and they've arrived here many years ago. And they are in not very good condition. However, we are anticipating uh, getting these on, ex on a display here in the entranceway sometime hopefully over the next year. And the first thing we need to do is work out how to preserve what we've got and stop the rust from, or the corrosion basically, from making it fall apart totally. Uh, so the, that, uh, the such element there of part of a geodesic structure mm. uh, and the far piece has similarly bits of the geodesic structure. Uh, the, the wheel hub down here isn't actually anything to do with the Warwick, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, these are rusty parts here, yeah. or corrosive, corroded parts, these are the parts that are left. Uh, in fact, uh, having worked, found out roughly where it was that it, uh, uh, it, was, it was found, uh, Andy Jordan, that is, uh, uh, actually managed to find the actual number of the aircraft and the records for that aircraft uh, before it crashed. And we have a precise date as well from that which I believe was in, uh, in, in the early or mid part of the 40s when it crashed. So we now we are at the front end of the overall chamber and the item above my head basically is part of the uh, supersonic wind tunnel that was put in in the late 50s uh, for testing for basically up to Mach 4. Uh, and what we can see here is the elements which include the, uh, the expansion joints so that when you had, if it was particularly cold, then you needed to be able to take up the, the, well, the contraction, basically, of all the parts. Or if it was hot, then it would actually expand. And that, this part here is there to allow for that expansion. And as we look up into the chamber, you can see that it's sealed against the side of the chamber. Uh, and uh, on the other side, there's a, a, a cap that they put over it to uh, uh, basically cap it off when they weren't, wasn't being used. So all this was, I say, was put in for, uh, with, after following one of Barnes Wallace's uh, n neat ideas, no doubt, in terms of being able to use the uh, low pressure in the, the chamber to actually create a uh, high speed flow of air, uh, which was up to about Mach 4 if you took the chamber all the way down or up, depending how you looked at it, uh, or you, uh, whatever level of pressure you needed. Uh, and for most of the tests they'll be doing to look for measurements around Mach 2, I would imagine. So for Concord or for things like the later uh, Tornado uh, and other uh, uh, supersonic kind of aircraft that they might have tested in there, then they'll probably be working around the two Mach 2 area. Uh, so in principle, basically, what you would do is actually create the uh, pressure difference between what was the balloon hanger, which has been mentioned before, which is where our McLaren display currently is, and the chamber, which is very low pressure. Uh, and when you move the valve away, which is just behind this wall here, you would start with a very high flow of air around up to Mach 4, and that would gradually reduce with time as the pressures equalized and you would then take more measurements or take the pictures you're looking for at the appropriate speed during that session in terms of when it was reducing in pressure. So you went through the, the particular speed you're interested in and you would take pictures of the shock waves or whatever it was you're interested in trying to, to actually investigate. And as we're leaving uh, the underside of the chamber, one other point that we've already been mentioning about uh, expansion joints on the supersonic wind tunnel, in here on these ducts that uh, go all the way around the chamber, you can see rather mu much larger expansion joints, uh, one on the top there and one at the bottom. And uh, on this particular one, there's a little device, a little measuring device that is, I think is meant to indicate the uh, uh, positioning within that expansion joint. Uh, we, we have looked at over the years, but it's never moved that I'm aware of uh, when, uh, between, say, about um, zero degrees, like it feels like today, or up to maybe 15 or so degrees in the summer. But uh, I, whether these are still there for moving, I don't know. But uh, on the other side of the chamber itself, as uh, there are similar uh, expansion joints of that nature, which uh, go on the other of the... Uh, uh, ducts that go round, so there's a, one more there and another further up which you probably can't quite see, 
But on this side, where we have all these pipes, the, uh, the methanol pipes, the, uh, they have what's known as a uh, swan neck expansion uh, uh, system. So basically the pipe work here would be going from around maybe 10 degrees Celsius under here down to minus 60. So there's quite a lot of expansion in the pipes. So they have to cater for that, which is why they put these swan necks in. And uh, as you can see, they vary in size depending on the actual cross section of the pipes. Uh, Clearly they never had any particular problems uh, with these, but uh, I, I imagine that uh, if you did put the appropriate uh, mitigation in there, you'd probably end up having significant leaks occurring over the years where these are uh, all the joints that you can see there all get stressed very highly. So when we were underneath the chamber just now, we saw the parts of the supersonic wind tunnel as it connected to the main part of the chamber where we are now standing within. And this is the uh, an item which is put over the, uh, the, the hole, shall we say, through which the uh, fast moving air would have come through and it's been bolted down many times to create a seal so that uh, when this chamber was being used and the supersonic wind tunnel itself wasn't being used, there could be effectively uh, nearly a vacuum inside the chamber and uh, basically air pressure immediately the other side of this particular uh, round dome which uh, sounds quite nice really and the other thing that I uh, could mention is uh, there was a an item mentioned by Joe Hancock in his history where somebody got it wrong uh, and while they were using the, the uh, supersonic wind tunnel they came left it after uh, one night came back the next morning and the practice should have been to, as what they say, was to bring the chamber down, I, re I release the pressure in here, or the, the vacuum, should I say, in here, so that it was even between within the chamber and where the uh, uh, supersonic wind tunnel test section was. Uh, unfortunately, someone had forgotten to do that, so they had all this test equipment inside the uh, test area, in, in which would have been next door, uh, and then somebody basically operated the valve just to test it out, and all of a sudden, there was a very large amount of air sucked through, including all the test equipment, which then came into here and apparently smashed into the roof and uh, destroyed a number of the lights that were then originally up there. So that was something they uh, decided wasn't a good idea, and hopefully they managed to avoid that problem again. So anyway, that was a, a little story that uh, Joe Hangup told. OK, well, thank you for visiting us today and seeing this video that uh, we talked about the undercroft or, and the uh, supersonic wind tunnel elements. And uh, we hope you enjoyed it and hope you will join us again shortly when we uh, hope to do another video which uh, will cover areas such as around the back of the chamber here, those elements which we don't normally get to see.